Wednesday, October 9th, 2024. You are listening to the Daily Dose Sports Podcast, and I am your host, Clint Daly, coming to you from my high city here in Denver, Colorado. And we are back for another week of talking sports with a dose of common sense. Hey, happy Wednesday to you. You know, I hope that you had a good weekend. I hope that your week is now going well. I hope you, your family, your friends, you're all staying strong and you are all staying healthy. And you know, I actually spent a little more time this past weekend with the mayor of our fine town and his lovely wife, who, by the way, made the most amazing pasole ever. While we watch my Denver Broncos win their third game in a row. Oh, I'm telling you, it was a good time. And no, I'm not booking Super Bowl tickets or anything like that. Beating a bad team is no reason to go all crazy. Again, we didn't like light the couch on fire in the yard or anything. We didn't start screaming about how the Broncos now deserve in the playoffs. Again, we don't live in Boulder. But life is good. Hey, are you watching those Major League Baseball playoffs? Yeah, because for right now, at least, baseball has gotten really, really interesting. Hey, that wild card round was crazy. Let's start off with the American League, where the lowest seed Detroit Tigers beat the Houston Astros. And then the number five Kansas City Royals advanced past the Baltimore Orioles. In the National League, the number four San Diego Padres beat the number five Atlanta Braves, who we kind of thought might be dangerous. And the number six New York Mets sent home the number three Milwaukee Brewers in heartbreaking fashion again. You know, that best of three format in the wildcard round, it is just so fun. Kind of wish they'd leave it on all the time. So now we are on to the divisional round, which has been way closer than any of us may have expected. Remember, this is a best of just five. Now, incredibly, all four Major League Baseball divisional series were tied at one to one. That is for the first time in history. In the American League, the New York Yankees have that monster lineup and their pitching has been slowly improving. Meanwhile, the Kansas City Royals have that speed and defense. So this is actually a really fun matchup. Can the Yankees actually live up to all the hype? We're going to see. The Cleveland Guardians have their solid pitching and quality defense. But you know those Detroit Tigers? They just keep scrapping with that no-name lineup. And honestly, I expect that stadium to be absolute bedlam. Remember, that game is today at, like, I don't know, lunchtime. Because game three starts at, I don't know, one o'clock or something in the afternoon. Major League Baseball is insane. Moving over to the National League Division Series We have the San Diego Padres facing the Los Angeles Dodgers, and this series is heated and hateful and spiteful. These two teams genuinely hate each other. We have had balls thrown at people. We have had fans throwing things on the field. This series is fun, even if you don't care about baseball. Of course, the San Diego Padres got a huge win last night, but you know, the Padres match up well with the Dodgers. I honestly, I expect this to go the distance. And I really think it's going to have us on the edge of our seat in every single game. Now, the other series in the National League, it's not quite as hot as Padres Dodgers, but hey, it is close. The Philadelphia Phillies are just talented everywhere. They can beat you in so many different ways. Oh, and by the way, if anyone can predict what these New York Mets will do next, go to Vegas and bet your house. Because that team is so wildly unpredictable from pitch to pitch, let alone from game to game. Yesterday, those Mets took a two-to-one lead. But again, I have no idea what is coming next here. You know, this time of year, it honestly is just the best. We have football. We have baseball that's interesting. Now we're going to start getting some other things cranking up as well. Hey, today on The Dose, we all know the teams in both college football and the NFL that everyone was talking about going into the season, right? We know who the favorites were. But today, we're actually going to be discussing some of the teams that no one really expected to be good, and they're actually surprising everyone so far. We're going to try to figure out whether or not they are actually for real or not. That might not be easy to gauge just yet, 
but we'll do our best. And we will also have a Daily Dose Top 5 for you today. You know, we are seeing something take place in the NFL this year, but we have actually seen it before. You just might have forgotten about a few of them. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. But first, let's discuss a little sports news. And of course, the big news yesterday was in the NFL, where after starting the season two and three, the New York Jets have already fired head coach Robert Sala. Defensive coordinator Jeff Ulbrich will be the interim head coach. Now, Sala was hired by the Jets in 2021. He has just a 20 and 36 record as the team's head coach. But Sala's firing actually marks the first time in owner Woody Johnson's 25-year tenure that he has actually pulled the plug on a coach in the middle of the season. But, you know, after last season, where they finished 7-10, and 10, Johnson said he was livid with the outcome and he raised the stakes for Sala. He demanded improvement, and that just hasn't happened. Now, there's a couple of problems with the New York Jets, and by a couple, I mean a couple thousand. One, the Jets have hitched their wagon to 40-year-old quarterback Aaron Rodgers who kind of looks like maybe he was caught and severely beaten by Father Time recently. But remember, Sala doesn't have anything to do with that dreadful offense. That is on offensive coordinator Nathaniel Hackett and, you know, Rodgers himself. But, you know, there is one problem that Sala does kind of have to answer for. The Jets have been an undisciplined mess. You know, through five games, the Jets have been penalized 31 times for 352 yards. That's an average of like 70 yards a game. I mean, that doesn't help Salah's case at all. I will say this, and keep this in mind. The Jets will now face the Buffalo Bills this next Monday night. Hey, be careful, Bills. It might sound crazy, and understand it might not last, but I'm telling you, the Jets will probably play with their hair absolutely on fire in this next game. Because everyone in the building is now on notice for their jobs. The Jets could be dangerous in this game. You know, you might have missed this one. I know most people probably did. But the NBA opened their preseason last week with the NBA champion Boston Celtics facing my hometown Denver Nuggets. They actually played the first preseason game in Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates. The Celtics actually won the opener 107-103 in a big who cares game, but did you hear what I just said? The National Basketball Association opened their preseason in the United Arab Emirates. Huh. Do you remember back in 2017 when the NBA actually pulled their all-star game away from Charlotte, North Carolina, due to a controversial state law that was seen as discriminatory against transgender people. In March of 2016, North Carolina passed House Bill 2, also known as the Bathroom Bill, and the law eliminated anti-discrimination protections for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. So the NBA then told Charlotte, nope, we're not going to hold our all-star game in your town. No way. Not on our watch. Hey, say what you want about the NBA, but this league stands up for their principles. They hold their ground. Well, they hold their ground until money comes into play. And then they don't really care at all, because we all remember LeBron James threw a fit when someone said something bad about China, who, I might add, tends toward not really respecting civil rights in any capacity. And now, the NBA launched their preseason in the United Arab Emirates. Does anyone know how the United Arab Emirates treats transgender people? Because that is a really important cause to the NBA, apparently, right? Oh, are they still playing lawn darts with him off of tall buildings in the United Arab Emirates? Got it. So you don't really care about transgender people. You care about trying to make a political statement to one side, but money, as usual with the NBA talks. You know, I just can't figure out why NBA ratings keep tumbling down every single year and why, for the last five NBA seasons or so, they have had the worst TV ratings in NBA Finals history. It's almost like people are tired of their political posturing. Just remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. You know what, though? Enough about the NBA. That league's getting on my nerves. 
Let's get over to the WNBA postseason, which has now reached the WNBA finals, where the Okay, so going into the NFL season, we all had a few teams that we were looking at as being the favorites, right? Everyone was talking about the Kansas City Chiefs and the Houston Texans and the Buffalo Bills and the Baltimore Ravens in the AFC. And we all kind of like the Philadelphia Eagles, San Francisco 49ers, and the Detroit Lions in the NFC. And while the NFL season is nothing if not long, and a number of these teams are still going to make a run, the one thing that is standing out to me right now is how many teams we have that have surprised us by being way better than we expected. So right now, I want to look at a few of them, and I want to try to figure out, are they real? Are they true contenders? Or is this all going to fall apart very soon because they are at least a little bit fake? And I want to start with the surprise of the NFL. And that, of course, is the Minnesota Vikings. Hey, who had the Vikings starting off the season 5-0? and But that is currently where they stand. When the Vikings got rid of Kirk Cousins and then they drafted J.J. McCarthy and then he went down with the knee injury and then they turned over the reins to Sam Darnold, we all went, well, that's a wrap. But that hasn't been the case. Darnold has played really well. He has a couple of quality receivers and the defense has been pretty stout. They're allowing just 15 points a game. Now, say what you will about defensive coordinator Brian Flores, but as he proved in Miami, Dude is pretty hard on quarterbacks. Man, that's just mean. The Vikings have also played a pretty tough schedule. And they've beaten everyone they've played. Now, what could derail Minnesota is what we saw on Sunday. The injury they had to running back Aaron Jones. And when he went down, that offense struggled a little bit. Because all of that pressure went to Darnold. But it sounds like Jones should be okay. And if so, I really think the Vikings might actually be a legit contender. They look pretty good on both sides of the ball. We move next to maybe the next most surprising team in the entire league, and that is the Washington Commanders, who are now 4-1. and one. And rookie quarterback Jaden Daniels, he looks like pretty easily the rookie of the year and maybe even the MVP of the league. No one expected anything from Washington. But right now, the Commanders are scoring 31 points a game, and they're doing it by running the ball down your throat and then letting Jaden Daniels make a big play downfield. And right now, he's playing really, really well. He's making all those plays. Daniels is already responsible for eight touchdowns on the year. The Washington defense has been way better than expected. Hey, maybe Dan Quinn has made this team a contender already. But here's my word of caution with the commanders. And I'm not saying they're totally fake. I don't think they are. But remember this. They lost their opener to Tampa. Then they won four in a row. But those four teams they've beaten, combined record, is just six and 14. Here is my bigger concern for Washington. Jaden Daniels has to be careful because he does take some hits. And we've already seen a few starting quarterbacks this year knocked out of games, knocked out for the season. The commanders, I mean, they shouldn't apologize for being four and one, but I'm going to go ahead and bet that by the end of, let's say, the next month or so, Washington's going to come back to earth, and they might come back a little bit hard. Next up, the Pittsburgh Steelers have been better than expected. We all kind of thought they might be at the back of that division, but it is primarily because of the play of that nasty defense and also due to the fact that quarterback Justin Fields has been at least okay. The Steelers have played a pretty solid schedule, and they're currently 3-2, and two, which, like I said, might be a little bit better than we expected. Now, they did just lose that tough one on Sunday night to the Dallas Cowboys at home. But are the Steelers actually for real? And I'll be honest, it's hard to say. Because this franchise always seems to find a way to scrape out wins. But I do have some concerns about them. Because I'm starting to see a major flaw. And it's not on the offensive side of the ball. In both of their losses this year to Dallas and to the Indianapolis Colts, the Pittsburgh Steelers couldn't consistently stop the run. Now, that could be a formula for disaster. Because not only does it wear your defense out, but your limited offense barely sees the ball. Now, the Pittsburgh schedule is soft in the middle, but it will beef up down that final stretch. And I think the Steelers are actually still going to be hard-pressed to make the playoffs 
because they are going to finish with a nasty, nasty stretch of games. Now, most of the preseason prognosticators looked at the NFC South in a very similar way. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers won this bad division last year, and they barely won it. But they were kind of fake. And Atlanta should take the title from them pretty easily. Well, Atlanta is definitely improving. But Tampa is still going to be a pain. Tampa is now 3-2 and two as well, and they have had two kind of weird losses. One, where they just completely were sleepwalking against my Denver Broncos at home. And then two, that crazy Thursday night game this past week against Atlanta. But look at Tampa's wins. They beat Washington, they beat Detroit, and they beat Philadelphia. Those are pretty good wins. You know, if Baker Mayfield continues to play well, and if they could find a consistent running game, Hey, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they're going to be at least in it. Let's finish off the NFL teams that are surprising us so far with the Seattle Seahawks, who are a team that I had a really hard time figuring out prior to the season. And now I'm really having a hard time figuring them out from one week to the next. But they are three and two. They are on top of the NFC West right now. Who saw that coming? You know, the Seahawks actually started the season three and oh, but they've now lost two games in a row, one to Detroit. And this last week against the New York Giants, and I'm not feeling great about this team as we move forward, to be honest. They have played one of the softest schedules in the entire league, and that loss to the Giants, yeah, that's concerning. Quarterback Geno Smith has been very good, but the key for Seattle has been their defense has been a little bit soft. Again, you can run the ball against them. And I would just bet that's going to be a problem in that division. In the NFC West, there are a couple of teams over there. They're going to try to run the ball right down Seattle's throat. The Seahawks may stumble down the latter half of their schedule. They're going to have to get way tougher if they are actually going to be a playoff team. But let's move over right now to the world of college football. We're on Saturday. We saw complete insanity taking place. You know, every season... We have these weeks where we don't have as many top 25 matchups and we all just kind of go, well, there are some games, but they probably won't be that good. And those are the weeks that keep producing these wild upsets. On Saturday, we saw upsets galore. Number one, Alabama was upset by Vanderbilt in a game that reminded us that, you know, replacing the guy is never an easy job and don't look now. But the Bama fans are already grumbling about Kalen DeVore's defense. You know they're all saying the same thing. Well, Nick Saban wouldn't let that happen. Now, don't get me wrong. These are the same people that were saying Nick was past his prime two last year. But they're already starting to grumble. We're not done. Number four, Tennessee struggled to put together any offense against Arkansas. And Arkansas head coach Sam Pittman got the biggest win that he has had so far in Fayetteville. Number nine, Missouri was looking like a surprise this season. And then they went to College Station this last week and Texas A&M beat them like Johnny Manziel beat Rehab. Oh no, you didn't. They never had a chance. Number 10, Michigan went to Washington. They got pounded. Number 11, USC went to Minnesota and got punched in the mouth. SMU beat number 22, Louisville. And number 25, UNLV lost at home to Syracuse. Hey, it was a completely wild weekend in college football, and that's not even counting. Number eight, Miami having to come back from being down 35 to 10 in the third quarter to beat Cal 39 to 38. You know, even though the Pac-12 no longer exists, somehow it's still pac 12 Now understand, some of these top teams with losses, hey, they're still going to the college football playoff. Because you can now afford one loss if you're a top team. Just don't lose two. Because then things could get a little bit dicey. But again, we knew the favorites in college football. They're usually the same names every single season, right? But who are the teams that are starting to get our attention? And are they actually for real? And let's start with those two service academies that have started the season strong. Do you realize that for the first time since 1996, the Army cadets are 5-0? and And for the first time since 2017, Navy is also 5-0. and Now, I know it won't happen. But honestly, how cool would it be if we had a military academy 
bus through to be that group of five team that makes the college football playoff? Well, we've got to ask, are either of these two teams truly capable? Well, so far, Army has crushed their five opponents by an average score of 39 to 10. That is dominance. And Army is tough. But here's my concern. Their strength of schedule ranks just 120th. And they still have Notre Dame, and they still have Navy on their schedule. So Army is going to be tested eventually. Meanwhile, Navy is also 5-0, and and they are scoring some big points. Navy is averaging 42 points a game. But again, they have also played a soft schedule. It ranks 112th, and they also still have Notre Dame and Army. Now, here is my concern for these two service academies. They care the most about beating each other. But they could easily slip up to a team like Notre Dame. And they could easily slip up to just some no-name, unranked garbage team. I hope it doesn't happen. I want one of them in the playoff. I think it would actually be really fun. Let's move over to the ACC, where we talked about Florida State and Miami and Clemson. But it is actually the Pitt Panthers that are still undefeated. Now, they haven't played any great teams yet. Their strength of schedule sits right now at number 62. But they have beaten West Virginia, which could be a better win than we originally thought. Pitt quarterback Eli Holstein has now thrown for three touchdowns in each of their wins this season. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because he had actually signed to play at Alabama and then transferred to Pitt instead. And he is doing the most with his opportunity. Next up for Pitt is a very dejected Cal team. But then Pitt will have to go to SMU and then they will host Clemson. Can Pitt keep things rolling? Could they be a sneaky team to get into the playoff? I think they will for another few weeks. And then I think this soft schedule is going to catch up with them. And they're going to take a loss, maybe two, maybe three. Let's move over to the Big 12. Because all of the Big 12 talk going into the season was about teams like Kansas State and Utah and Arizona. But we may have overlooked those BYU Cougars. Hey, the Cougs are now up to number 14. They have already beaten SMU. They have already beaten Baylor. Oh, and they have already absolutely curb stomped Kansas State. Hey, quarterback Jake Retzlaff, he's a dual threat player. He is leading the team in both passing and rushing. He's already responsible for 13 touchdowns this year. The key for me, where I think BYU actually might be for real, is that Cougar defense. Hey, head coach Kalani Sataki, he has turned this defense into a strength. And right now, despite playing the 27th toughest schedule in the country, the Cougars are allowing just 15 points per game. And again, that has been against some pretty dangerous offenses. BYU is legit. Hey, don't look now. The Cougars are a serious college football playoff threat. Let's stay in the Big 12 where we have one other team that no one was talking about prior to the season, and that is the Iowa State Cyclones. Do you realize that Iowa State is now getting into that vicinity of being a top 10 team in the country? Who knew, right? Now, they did have to scrape out a one-point win at their rival, Iowa, to open the season, but then they pummeled Houston on the road. Quarterback Rocco Brecht, he hasn't been all that flashy, but he's been at least efficient. The Cyclones have played the 37th toughest schedule in the country, but that's about to get tougher. Next up, they have a very dangerous West Virginia team, and then they are going to close out their season at Utah and against Kansas State in back-to-back games. I mean, I'm sorry, that might just be too much to overcome. I like Iowa State as a friend, but I'm not sure they're going to be up to that task. That might be too much. We move to the Big Ten. Where, of course, the household names got all the preseason hype. Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Oregon. I know, Oregon still sounds weird. But, you know, there wasn't one person talking about Indiana. This isn't basketball. And also, this isn't the 80s. But the Indiana Hoosiers are already bowl eligible after they started the season 6-0. The Hoosiers right now are scoring 49 points per game with senior quarterback Curtis Rourke. He actually is a transfer from Ohio University. Hey, this kid knows what he's doing. He's experienced. But again, my concern for Indiana is that strength of schedule. It sits at 67th. Now, I do think Indiana can play a little because 
the bad teams they're playing, they're pounding them. But they're going to have to play Nebraska. They're going to have to play Washington. They're going to have to play Ohio State. Indiana could have a tough finish to their season. Hey, you're going to get in a bowl game. Like, you know, the Sun Bowl or like the Motor City Weed Eater Bowl or whatever. It's just not going to be a huge bowl game. I'm going to finish off in the SEC with a team that I didn't expect to do much this year. Oh, they'll be okay. But they started the season with a 10-point loss to Notre Dame. But I'm telling you, Texas A&M, they might actually be a team to keep an eye on. Yes, they had that loss in their opener, and I watched that game. They did not play well. But A&M did crush Missouri on Saturday. And that defense is pretty good. But the thing that makes me think A&M could still be a threat is the schedule shapes up really well for them. They have LSU on the schedule, and then they close out their regular season against Texas. But both of those games are in College Station. If A&M just wins the games that they should, and then they are maybe respectable against Texas, let alone if they beat Texas, we could actually see Texas A&M having a shot at making the college football playoff, which would be wild, because let's be honest, Texas A&M never really does anything that impressive. Now, as we do so many weeks here at the Daily Dose, we need to get over to our Daily Dose Top 5. Five! You know, we are witnessing something very interesting in the NFL this season. We have quarterbacks that were basically cast-offs with one team stepping into a new situation in a new city, and they're actually looking pretty good. Last season in Tennessee, backup quarterback Malik Willis literally looked like the worst quarterback in the entire league. This year, he had to step in for Jordan Love in Green Bay. Willis looked pretty good. He threw two touchdowns, and he ran for another, and he actually won two games as a starter. Justin Fields could never figure things out in Chicago, but he's gone to Pittsburgh, playing pretty well. Baker Mayfield left Cleveland for Tampa. He looks like a completely different player, and there is no better example of this phenomenon that playing quarterback can sometimes come down to your situation over your talent than Minnesota and, of course, Sam Darnold. Hey, Darnold was 13-25 and 25 in New York with the Jets, but he went to San Francisco. He kind of revived his career. He kind of remembered how to play. They brought him up to speed. Now he's looking strong with the Vikings. Today, our Daily Dose Top 5 is counting down the top five quarterbacks who actually improved with a second chance. We start off at number five. Five. And we start with another guy that began his career with the New York Jets. Coincidence? Probably not. Drafted in 2013 by the Jets, Geno Smith was the starter from day one, and it did not go well. He started strong. He went 8-8 eight and eight as a rookie, but then he went just 4-11 and 11 after that. He would eventually be benched. He would eventually get injured. He would eventually go to the New York Giants instead, but he only started one game, fumbled twice, lost to the Raiders. He was a backup with the Chargers before eventually going to Seattle to back up Russell Wilson. But when Wilson went to Denver, Geno stepped in and he's been pretty good. Geno Smith has now gone 21 and 19 as a starter. He has 60 touchdowns to just 25 interceptions. Now, maybe it was the time he did get to sit and watch and learn. Maybe it was playing for head coach Pete Carroll. Whatever it was, Geno Smith got a new start in Seattle and he's made the most of it. And he comes in today on our list at number five. We go to number four, four. and we get to another guy that was drafted high. How high? Tried the highest, tried the overall number one pick in 2005, because that is when the San Francisco 49ers selected Utah quarterback Alex Smith. Here's the problem. Niners fans won Cal quarterback Aaron Rodgers, not the guy from Utah with the little baby hands. Hey, Smith struggled in the Bay Area. He had a little bit of talent around him. He had running back Frank Gore. He had tight end Vernon Davis, but Smith struggled and he also dealt with a number of injuries. In seven seasons with the 49ers, Alex Smith was just barely better than 500 at 38, 36, and 1. Now, he didn't have the benefit of playing with great offensive coaches. 
and he would eventually be traded to the Kansas City Chiefs in 2013. And, you know, playing under Andy Reid made Alex Smith look like a completely different player. Alex Smith went 50 and 26 as a starter with the Chiefs. Was it playing with a good offensive coach? Yeah. Was it playing with more supportive fans? Yeah, probably. But he also didn't have those expectations that go with being the number one pick. Alex Smith comes in today at number four. We reached number three on our list today. And we get to a player that, again, was in a tough spot. He was a top flight quarterback coming out of college, but he went to a bad team. And he endured a lot of years on teams that just didn't have as much talent. He got beat up a lot. But he did end up getting the ultimate vindication. Matthew Stafford was drafted out of Georgia in 2009, again, with the number one overall pick. Hey, he had some receivers at times, but he never had much of a defense, never had too much help coaching-wise, and he never had an offensive line. From 2009 to 2020, Matt Stafford was 74, 90, and 1 as the starter. Hey, he battled. He played tough. He even made it to one Pro Bowl in 2014. But he made it to the postseason in just three seasons, and he never won a single game. He had no help. In 2020, Stafford was traded to Los Angeles for quarterback Jared Goff, another guy, honestly, that could have made this list. And so far, in four seasons, Matthew Stafford is now 25-21 and 21 with the Rams. Oh, and by the way, he won Super Bowl 56, and he had never even won a playoff game in Detroit. Hey. He changed cities. He won it all. Matthew Stafford comes in today at number three. We arrive at number two on our list of NFL quarterbacks that improved with a change of scenery. And we reach a guy that when I tell you he wasn't good at first, you might say, Clint, you're crazy. But this guy went a very different route. He was drafted in 1984 out of BYU in the supplemental draft by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because when he came out of college, he actually jumped straight to the USFL. But Tampa was a mess. And in two seasons, Steve Young was just 3-16 and 16 as the starter. Was it because he couldn't play? Of course not. It was because he was in a mess of a franchise. The Bucs didn't like him either, so they went and drafted quarterback Vinny Testaverde in 1987, and they basically gave Young away to the San Francisco 49ers. After he sat behind Joe Montana for four or five seasons, Steve Young got his chance to be the guy, and all he did was post the highest quarterback rating ever while going 91 and 33 as the starter. Oh, and he won Super Bowl 29 by throwing six touchdowns, which is still a record, and he was named the game's MVP. Hey, Steve Young could always play. He just needed a better situation. Well, he got it in San Francisco, and he comes in today on our list at number two. So we reach the number one quarterback that benefited the most from changing teams and changing cities and changing coaches. And we go to a guy that most people just think he was always good. Not so, my friends. This guy was drafted by the San Diego Chargers in 2001. But he was the backup to Doug Flutie. Well, he beat Flutie out the following season and he ended up being named the starter. And it didn't really go that well. He would show flashes but he just threw too many interceptions. He would go 30 and 28 as a starter, just barely above 500 for the Chargers. And in 2004, they were not that enthralled with him, so they drafted Phillip Rivers out of North Carolina State. And in the final game of the 2005 season, Drew Brees suffered a completely blown rotator cuff and a torn labrum. So the Chargers moved on to Rivers. And Breeze would eventually move on to New Orleans where he would team up with head coach Sean Payton. And Drew Breeze would break Johnny Unitas' long-standing record of consecutive games with a touchdown pass. Oh, and he would also win Super Bowl 44 and the Super Bowl MVP award. Drew Breeze was a 13-time Pro Bowler. He was never named to a Pro Bowl in San Diego. Did he suddenly just get good? No, he went to a better situation with a better coach and a better system and a better team, and he found his game. You know, so many times we see these quarterbacks in the NFL and we blame them for all the bad things when really they're just one guy. They get too much credit. 
and they get too much blame. Sometimes being surrounded by better teams in a better situation with better coaches and better players without all of those high expectations, sometimes when we see that, we see a massive change in their career. We see their career take off. It's not an accident. They just needed some help. And sometimes a change of scenery can do just that. Hey, next week on The Dose, we will, of course, be keeping you up with all that is going on in the world of sports. And, you know, we just might have to discuss a few fan bases that might be smashing the panic button right now. Might have to talk about whether or not it is too early for that just yet. So be sure that you tune in and be sure to let a friend know to do the same. Hey, I want to say thank you so much to each and every one of you for listening to The Daily Dose every week. Thanks for the emails, texts, and tweets. Always know you can email the podcast at dailydosesports at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. But thanks for stopping by dailydosesports.com. We do have new articles going up each week. We do have links to the podcast, and we do have links to the YouTube video. But more than anything, I want to thank you for sharing the show, for sharing the videos, for sharing the articles when you do see them. We absolutely love it when you do that. I say thank you to Jess P. Could not do any of this without you. I will see you all next Wednesday. Have a great week, everybody. Man, that's just mean.